I'd like to talk today about something I think is very important. It's about Cardinal Fernandez's moral theology and pastoral approach. You know, many of you know Cardinal Fernandez is the new prefect for the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith, a position held previously by Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope. Benedict XVI and Cardinal Mueller, who continues to be a tremendous defender of the faith and critic of what Cardinal Fernandez is doing, which is very unusual, seeing this kind of disunity breaking out in the church. But basically, Archbishop Fernandez, now Cardinal Fernandez, has been the theological advisor, uh, yeah, theological expert for Pope Francis for many years. He's from Argentina. He himself was investigated by the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith because of his own writings. And some of those writings now have, have come to light. And uh, they're pretty awful. There's the uh, book he wrote about erotic kissing, supposedly developed as a catechesis for young people uh, with very explicit stuff that's quite honestly disgusting, and it's not designed really to be catechetical, I would say. The, the English translation is available online. I don't recommend people read it, but it talks about how to kiss better and things like that and uh, quotes erotic poetry, and whoever in their right mind thinks that this is something useful for teenagers, well, and then just recently, some other books of his and articles kind of came to light. And this one, unfortunately, mixes explicit sexuality with mysticism. It talks about how the erotic and the mystical uh, are, are, are closely aligned, that people can maybe even be uh, doing gravely wrong sexual things, but have a mystical experience. And he specifically mentions people having a homosexual encounter uh, who could nevertheless have a genuine mystical encounter at the same time in the sexual and the mix, mi mystical mixed together. Now, in the mystics, there's no question about it that erotic imagery, in the Bible, erotic imagery is sometimes used to point to the Lord. But what it's pointing to is a deep, personal, intimate relationship that indeed is intense, but it's not physically, biologically arousing. <laughs> and that's exactly what Cardinal Fernandez is talking about in these books. It reminds me, unfortunately, of some of the horrible things that have come to light recently, where very spiritual people like Jean Vanier uh, sort of let let his spirituality and his sexuality kind of mingle together in a way that took advantage of people that he was counseling. It's so easy for people who are genuinely spiritual people to uh, justify sexual expression sometimes or sexual feelings sometimes or even sexual activity sometimes with people that they're close to spiritually, either saying that God will understand or we're special people and this is okay for us. Same thing also came to light with that Jesuit, Father Rupnik, the famous Jesuit artist who has apparently abused lots of people and of nuns in his religious order that he founded uh, in absolutely disgusting ways. And the Pope refused to waive the Statue of Limitations when all these charges came out until a big uproar came out and said, wait a second, this is horrible. You you have to waive the statute of limitations, which the Pope had the possibility of doing. And he finally, after pressure, did it. And so he's being now tried or something or expelled from the Jesuits or something like that. But uh, for years, nobody wanted to deal with the awful stuff that he was doing. Now, in Cardinal Fernandez's book, he wrote 
when he was 36 years old. And so it's not like a, a, a book of one's youth. And as uh, Michael Pakaluk, who's a professor at Catholic University, pointed out, I'll say more about what Michael Pakaluk has pointed out. You know, it takes a long time to publish a book. You know, it takes lots of proofreading and editing. And, uh, you know, so this was a, a mature work. And it's awful. It's hard for me to believe that somebody who was spiritually and sexually healthy could could do such a thing like this. In the book, he describes a fantasy that a teenage girl described to him where Jesus is naked on the beach and uh, she starts caressing him and kissing him. And Mary kind of gives permission for this to happen and discreetly removes herself from the scene. This is blasphemous. This is wicked. This is something that nobody in their right mind would want to talk to a 16-year-old girl about. And if they did, they'd say, hey, this is really awful. Stop this. This is nonsense. You know, and um, so I would say what it made me think about I can't make a judgment on this, but it did make me think that when Archbishop Vigano, way back in the beginning, first published his cry saying there's a homosexual network in the Vatican and uh, Cardinal McCarrick's stuff has been covered up by people in high places, including the Pope. And, uh, you know, and then I think he started to go off the, the deep end, but uh, it makes you wonder whether all these people who are now advocating blessings of homosexual couples, even though now they're backtracking from that, but Cardinal Hollerick has openly said he doesn't believe that the Catholic teaching of homosexuality is true. And then you have other people uh, in Germany who obviously don't think it's, it's true and who are going full steam ahead blessing homosexual couples and active sexual relationships. And then you have Cardinal Fernandez publishing um, in the name of the Pope in, in the document on marriage after the synods of Morris Laetitia, where it's possible that people who are even though are in a state of sin, objectively wrong things, they may be okay with the Lord, and they may be doing as best they can, and so they should be admitted possibly to the Eucharist. And and then in this 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 book is just really awful. But anyway. How does he justify saying that people who are doing objectively wrong things may actually be in an okay relationship with the Lord and being and doing the best they can? Well, he quotes a, a text from the Catechism, where uh, section seventeen thirty five, where it says, Imputability and responsibility for an action can be diminished or even nullified by ignorance, inadvert inadvertence, duress, fear, habit, inordinate attachments, and other psychological or social factors. So that's for sure what the Catechism says. But it's only part of what the Catechism says. And yet, Dr. Pakaluk, uh it documented five different publications over the years where Archbishop Fernandez and now Cardinal Fernandez has quoted that one section from the catechism basically saying, yes, it's possible that people may have reduced culpability or no culpability because of all these different factors. But he really ignores the whole picture. I want to take a little time to fill in the whole picture because this is pretty serious. For example, in section 1754, just before section 1755, which says there may be mitigating circumstances that take away some culpability, it says the circumstances, including the consequences, are secondary elements of a moral act. They contribute to increasing or diminishing the moral goodness or evil of human acts. For example, the amount of money of the theft. They can also diminish or increase the agent's responsibility, such as acting out of a fear of death. 
Circumstances of themselves, though, cannot change the moral quality of acts themselves. They can make neither good nor right an action that is in itself, in itself evil. Sexual immorality is in itself evil. If even if there's reduced culpability, it doesn't make the act good in any way. Now, I felt like this was an important issue even before I heard of Archbishop Fernandez. Um, I wrote a book called A Church in Crises Pathways Forward. Chapter 6 is titled, Is Anybody Responsible? And honestly, it's a really valuable chapter. Uh, a lot of people have said it's made an original contribution to moral theology, and yet it's understandable, I think, for everybody. And what it says, basically, is that even though there may be reduced culpability, just like the Catechism says, the actions themselves are evil and wrong. And so what I'm saying is that rather than trying to determine for ourselves or for other people how fully or less responsible we are for certain actions, we got to hate evil actions. We got to hate sin. And that's why a couple of years ago, when a bishop asked the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, it's now called the Dicastery for the Doctrine of Faith, whether uh, blessings could be given for same sex relationships. And the same congregation that now Cardinal Fernandez is in charge of said, no, we can't bless sin. And we can't bless sin. And there's a lot of sophisticated language, a lot of you know complex kind of qualifications around the whole thing about same-sex blessings. I've done a whole video on same-sex blessings. But I've also done a video when Cardinal Fernandez was appointed to his new position called It's Now Unmistakably Clear Where We're Being Led. I'd like to refer you back to those videos. They fill in important parts of the picture. It's now unmistakably clear where we're being led, and I think it's getting clearer all the time. But anyway, I'd like to take a little time just to talk about why I wrote this chapter. I wrote it because priests in my class at the seminary in our summer program for STL students, these are priests who have already been ordained and they'd like to get an advanced degree a license in sacred theology that's granted through the Angelicum University in Rome through our seminary faculty in new evangelization. And we've had more than 100 priests go through the program. It's great. They're, they're my favorite group of people to teach, and I, I just really look forward to it. But one day in class, we were having a, a seminar, Stages of Spiritual Growth, and we were talking about serious grave sin. And we talked about the conditions of, for a mortal sin you know, grave matter, sufficient reflection, and full consent of the will. And one of the priests got up in class and said, you know, I think we misuse those conditions to justify sin in our own lives. Now, this is pretty bold. I was the only lay person there. that They trusted me. I'm not going to give out any names. But he said, look, guys, sometimes in the heat of the moment, we know what we'd like to do is wrong, and we do it anyway, and it isn't like we made a careful list of pros and cons and gave it really careful reflection, but we actually assented to a wrong action. We actually said yes to sin, and we, we, we delude ourselves. We, we fool ourselves in thinking that we're not fully ca culpable because it was like a you know, an act of passion or whatever. Well, this made me want to really understand what the truth is about culpability, what the truth is about mortal sin. And so I actually did a study of the catechism and the scripture, and, and there's some really important things that nobody talks about that need to be spoken about. Okay. So this is what the Catechism teaches about the conditions under which a sin needs to be mortal. Grave matter. 
and then it talks about knowledge and consent. It also presupposes knowledge of the sinful character of the act, of its opposition to God's law. It also implies a consent sufficiently deliberate to be a personal choice. And so what that priest was basically saying, even though it was a split-second decision, it really was sufficiently deliberate. It really was a decision or a choice we made. And then it goes on to say, this is the sections 1857 to 1859 of the Catechism. Then it goes on to say, feigned ignorance, pretended ignorance, and hardness of heart do not diminish, but rather increase the voluntary character of a sin. We're, we're notorious wanting to rationalize sin, rationalize bad actions. And what the Catechism says is that that kind of self-deception, that kind of feigned ignorance about what we're really doing, actually increases the voluntary character of the sin. Now, what that means is sometimes ignorance can be feigned. We can be culpable for our ignorance. Another place in the Catechism it says, it's, quote, about the final trial of the church. Then will the conduct of each one and the secrets of hearts be brought to light. Remember the prophecy of Simeon in Luke chapter 2 where baby Jesus is brought into the temple. I've spoken, I've done a whole video on that, uh, the beautiful prophecy of Simeon, where he says this child will be a sign of contradiction. He'll be a cause for the rise and the fall of many in Israel. He'll reveal the secrets of hearts. So when Jesus actually in his ministry revealed the secrets of hearts, some people were convicted of their sin and repented and believed, and some picked up rocks to stone him or shouted crucify him or plotted how to get him away by killing him. And Jesus said, the light comes into the world but some prefer the darkness. Some love the darkness more than the light. So this is the crisis in our hearts. Are we going to admit the light when it strikes our soul? Or are we going to cover it over and pretend we didn't see it? Are we going to feign ignorance of what's going on in our soul? Or are we going to admit it and open up to the Lord? It goes on to say, Then will the culpable unbelief that accounted the offer of God's grace as nothing be condemned? You know, we can have inculpable ignorance, but we can have culpable ignorance. The Catechism also says that, Section 1860, unintentional ignorance can diminish or even remove the imputability of a grave offense, but no one is deemed to be ignorant of the principles of the moral law, which are written in the conscience of every man. What the Catechism is saying is here is what Scripture says in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2. Everybody knows because of a light that God has given to each person's conscience that it's wrong to kill, that it's wrong to steal, that it's wrong to commit adultery, that it's wrong to tell lies. Everybody deep in their heart knows that. The promptings of feelings and passions can also diminish the voluntary and free character of the offense, as can external pressures or pathological disorders. And sin committed through malice by deliberate choice of evil is the gravest. So it's possible that, that culpability is reduced in, in many cases, but wait. Section 1791. This ignorance can often be imputed to personal responsibility. This is the case when a man takes little trouble to find out what is true and good, or when conscience is by degrees almost blinded through the habit of committing sin. In such cases, the person is culpable for the evil he commits. This reminds me of what St. Augustine said. You know, St. Augustine, at a certain point, when he finally decided he wanted to be a Christian, You know, said he was he was a slave. He couldn't get free. But he says he was responsible 
for getting into that situation. He was responsible uh, for a whole series of repeated acts he, younger when he was younger in his life that actually kind of strengthened the, the chains of sin in his life. So even though he really couldn't get free now, he was responsible for having gotten into that state. And that's why it says that people through the habit of committing sin can become blinded, but they're culpable for that blindness. People who are taking little trouble to find out what is true and good are culpable for that ignorance of not knowing what's true and good. You know, there's just a lot in this chapter, but I think you've got the picture. I, you can get this book at renewalministries.net. You can get it on Amazon.com. It's available in lots of different formats. And the main thing I want to say is that we need to spend less time trying to figure out what degree of culpability we or other people have for sin in our life and recognize that even if we're less culpable for all these different reasons that the catechism says could be the case, nevertheless, these are objectively gravely wrong things, and our heart's desire should be to get free of them and not accept them as something that has to happen in our life. You know, one of the things the catechism also says is absolutely a heresy to say that people can't get free of serious sin. God's grace is sufficient. What the Catechism also says is that when God commands something, he gives us the grace to do it. Now, this means that this truth has to be spoken with greater conviction, greater authority, greater frequency, and greater urgency than we're hearing right now. All we're hearing right now is God's merciful. He understands, you know, we're sort of getting the impression everybody gets a trophy. It kind of flows right into the whole universalism spirit. It, it's a distortion of what mercy really is. It's a distortion of the truth about sin. So I just am praying that the Lord would raise up more and more people in the church that will speak the word of God without compromise. Uh, that will speak the truth of the catechism without compromise, without just focusing on one little part like Cardinal Fernandez does. I just hope that people can be given every opportunity to believe and repent and so be saved and be delivered from the deception, the lies, the excuses, the rationalizations, the feigned ignorance, the uh, lazy approach to knowing the truth, the less than vigorous activity in, in, in turning away from sin in, in our lives. You know, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. Jesus says, come on, you're not going to drift into the kingdom of God. you got to make an effort. The kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violence bared away, the violent bared away, the violence of conversion, of repentance, of, of renunciation, of transformation, of being delivered from darkness and evil and demons into the freedom that comes from Christ. It sometimes only comes after a long period of struggle, but it comes. Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. Better enter the kingdom missing parts of our body rather than to go down to hell with an intact body. We need to have this in a document. We need to have this preached clearly. We need to not have the sophisticated, subtle, complex kind of arguments that sort of like are giving a wink and a nod that really it's not so bad. Sexual sin is not so bad. It is. It will kill us. It will send us to hell. Come on, we need to tell people the truth. We need to accept the truth for ourselves. Romans chapter 1 says, they're without excuse because God revealed himself through the creation, but they perversely rejected that revelation that God gives to every single person and exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped the creature rather than the creator and fell into sexual perversity, and all kinds of other disorders as well. Romans chapter 2 says, everybody's going to be judged on the basis of the light that God has given them. But boy, we got to treasure the light when it's given to us. I hope light is coming to you, and love is coming to you, and hope is coming to you, and courage is coming to you. 
in these words I'm speaking. I hope they are. I pray they are. You know, I'm going to be speaking on these things going on into the future, I think, until something really radically changes in the church or the world. I'd like you to be able to accompany us if, if you're interested, if you think it's helpful. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Renewal Ministries YouTube channel. Uh, click on the notifications bell, the little blue bell, and uh, you'll be notified every time we do a new video. Peter Herbrick and myself are regularly doing videos, which a lot of people are finding helpful. Uh, and if you're able to help us in our wider work, you know, we're doing mission work in 30 or 40 countries around the world. We're doing lots of things for priests and bishops. And uh, what you see here in the YouTube channel is the tip of the iceberg. Where we're hoping what we're doing here in the YouTube channel, besides all the people is helping directly, uh, kind of empowers uh, this, this larger mission that we're doing that we hope you can participate in. Oh, God bless you. See you next time.